Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to the class of Public International Law. We will discuss today Law of the Sea. I am Dr. Ashutosh Acharya, Senior Assistant Professor, Law Center 2, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Now, here today we will discuss one of the most important topic as far as history is concerned, as far as contemporary times are concerned as sea bears almost 70 percent of the area of the globe. It is pertinent to understand the law regulating that 70 percent of the area. Well, friends, I would also say most of it is unregulated. It may be tagged around under some head such as high seas or common heritage of mankind. However, there are certain areas attached to coastal states where states try to bear control or try to have control and they do also have control under certain legal regime. What is that legal regime? How does the law work? All of which will be discussed today. What are the rights and duties of the states as far as the sea area is concerned? Why states want to have such rights and duties over the sea area, we will discuss and understand all of that particular aspect. So, the learning objectives for the day would be to understand the different maritime zones. What are maritime zones? Friends, these are the areas which start from the sea area attached to a particular coastline of a particular state. And then as we move ahead towards high seas, we tend to understand that different areas have been demarked or you can say identified as far as sea is concerned. The closer the area of the sea, the closer the connection with the coastal state, the larger the control of the coastal state over the sea. To understand the measurement of maritime zones and this is necessary to have a universal rule or you can say a uniform rule as far as control over sea is concerned. Thirdly, to learn legal regime of baselines. What are baselines? We will understand that friends. It is nothing but a point or a line joining different points along the coastline from where the measurement of the sea is undertaken. To learn different rights and duties of coastal and flag state. What are coastal states? Nothing but the states that are adjacent to a sea which is in question or any state that is adjacent to sea would be a coastal state. As opposed to coastal state, we have flag state. Flag state is a state whose vessel is crossing from the coastline or near to the coastline of a coastal state. So, a ship coming from Europe may be travelling near India. So, if it is travelling near India, if the ship is belonging to France, then that particular ship will have a flag state bearance and jurisdiction and the flag state of that particular ship would be France and it would be bearing the flag of France, whereas the coastal state will be India. To enable the learners to identify the application of jurisdiction in different maritime zones. So, by this we also get to know firstly that there is now existence of jurisdiction, especially post 19th century or from 19th century at least we see such practices getting developed that is states started exercising jurisdiction not only over their land mass, but going beyond land mass and exercising jurisdiction over sea water as well. What was the necessity? The prime necessity for doing so was security purposes. Later on, it manifolded into economic reasons 
and it were then economic reasons that we see why states want to have jurisdiction. Today in contemporary times, the concerns pertaining to security are much higher, maybe to protect the trade, to protect ships, to protect economic interest or any other type of interest, the security concerns are much higher than any other day. And therefore, the aspect of jurisdiction by the states, that is the coastal states, has been increasing day by day. So, in order to settle down all of these claims by the states, we see in 20th century significant development where we see coming into being of United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea through this significant development of coming into force of the convention 1992. The states are now having a uniform rule and regulation with respect to exercise of jurisdiction, with respect to freedom over the sea, with respect to almost all the aspects of sea as far as its regulation by the states are concerned. What are their rights, what are their duties, how states are to act, almost all of it is now covered under United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. Therefore, we get to know that the governing law for law of the sea in today's time is United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. It not only comes up with provisions which are new in nature, which regulates new things that have come into being, but also recognizes customary practices that were undertaken by the states. Old practices which had taken the shape of international custom had also been now recognized and included within the folds of United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea 1982 to learn about the delimitation of continental shelf. Again, friends, a pertinent issue largely because now states realize the importance of having a continental shelf which is rich in resources. Continental shelf is the area, continental shelf is the area of the sea where most of the resources are found in sea. Friends, when science and technology was not that much developed, the concern was limited to having a jurisdiction or to secure the boundary line or the coastline only. Later on, they wanted to secure certain areas falling in the sea water which is attached to the coastline of a particular coastal state so that they can protect their boundaries, they can protect their land masses. But later on, with the advancement of scientific and technological developments, we got to know that there are huge amount of resources available in sea. Initially, sea was only used for trading purposes, food resources and to an extent security purposes, only to a limited extent. But then as we see expansion of ships, expansion of ship, shipping industry and the advancement of technology as far as ships are concerned. Also discovery of oil, discovery of minerals, discovery of numerous metals and elements that can be used for human progress. So these developmental aspects leading to human progress, leading to discovery of new minerals, metals and elements led to economic importance of sea and as it grew in 20th century, we see states then tend to started to have more and more control over the sea. The more control over the sea would mean more resources out of the sea. And therefore, the states now not only wanted to secure their security concerns, but also wanted to have a large chunk of share in the sea so that they can have more economic rise or more economic resources into their plate. So, therefore, continental shelf becomes an important subject matter as far as the states are concerned as they want to have larger area within the domain of continental shelf. So, where states are free to claim as much water as they want because there is no state either adjacent to them or opposite to them facing their coastline. 
the situation is not complex, UNCLOS settles down this particular position by giving them a certain area or allowing them to have control over continental shelf up to a certain point, then there is no problem as such because there is no conflict with any other state. Problem comes into being where there are two adjacent states or states situated opposite to each other and the free claim cannot be brought under, a free claim over the sea cannot be brought under the control of the coastal state or by either states. Let us say if the UNCLOS allows up to 200 nautical miles of exclusive economic zone or let us say 350 nautical miles at the max of continental shelf and you do not have 350 nautical mile or 200 nautical mile in front of you, what is the solution? Solution to this has been suggested under United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. Also through cases we will try to understand that how this delimitation of water takes place so that the states situated on the opposite sides or edges adjacent to each other can have proportionate share for each other and the economic resources can be divided accordingly without hampering the marine resources and other aspects of marine life. So friends, this is, these are our objectives. Now, as I said that it is an important part as far as claim over sea is concerned. So, we will see now that how measurement of control, how measurement of control over the sea can be done. So, let me friends draw for you that how measurement is to be done, to what extent United Nations Convention on law of the sea, the governing law demarcates the sea boundary, how and to what extent measurement is to be done. So friends, let us say this is a land mass starting from this point to this point. Let us say this is land. Now what we will do here is that we will start measuring from this particular point or you may say from this, if you start measuring from this particular point or from this particular point, let us assume that this is the horizontal position of the coastline. You have a coastal state, the line of which is horizontal in nature and you can see the horizontal line. So, let us assume that this is your horizontal line. Now, here from any point, either it may be here, it may be here or it may be situated here. The measurement has to be done that to what extent sea water belongs to you and what is the nature of control as far as sea water is concerned. Well friends, the law of the sea convention divides the sea water situated in front of the coastal state into four parts. Now these four parts are inclusive of territorial waters. Then contiguous zone, then we have exclusive economic zone which is known as EZ and then you have continental shelf. Well friends, how does this work and what is the measurement of these four zones as I have just mentioned here. So the first comes or the first zone that we have is territorial zone or known as territorial waters which is 12 nautical miles from the coastal state. Then after territorial waters you have contiguous zone which is again 12 nautical mile from the point where territorial water ends or you can say 24 nautical miles from the point from where territorial zone is to be measured or from the coastline. So, from coastline it is 24 nautical mile whereas from the point where territorial water ends it will be 12 nautical miles. After contiguous zone you have your EEZ which is 200 nautical miles. EEZ is known as exclusive economic zone. This exclusive economic zone is for economic purposes 
the jurisdictional control of the state diminishes as we move from coastline towards the high seas. So, wherever the jurisdiction or control over the sea ends, that particular area would be known as high seas. Now, in general parallels also, we can say that since the jurisdictional aspect is less at E, Z, in common parlance, you will see that that is also high seas. So, once we see that the control has diminished, we start with high seas, which is known as or which falls under common heritage of mankind. Now, friends, let us also understand that the effect of these zones are different as far as legal regime for coastal state is concerned. Now, from which point do we measure and what is the effect of having a territorial water or having a contiguous zone or having a EEZ? We will understand this particular aspect in the upcoming slides. But to give you a glimpse, an idea, let us understand that up to 12 nautical mile, which is territorial waters or territorial zone, this particular column, water column is to be treated in the same manner as that of the land territory. That is why it is termed as territorial waters because it here the coastal state can exercise the jurisdiction which is known as legislative jurisdiction. Now, whatever laws are passed in this part of the land territory will all be or would all be applicable here in the territorial sea. The same is not the case as far as contiguous zone is concerned. Here in the contiguous zone, only certain laws are made applicable. We will see that which may be pertaining to customs, etc. So, here in EEZ, which is 200 nautical miles, starting from this particular point, the measurement of EEZ is 200 nautical miles starting from this particular point that is coastal coastline and ranging up to 200 nautical miles. Now, here we see that in exclusive economic zone, as you can see here as well in the picture presented before you, in the exclusive economic zone, the idea of jurisdiction diminishes or the effect of jurisdiction diminishes. There is very limited area over which the coastal state can have control. The clear picture here before us, as we can see here, the 12 nautical mile territorial sea, then you have contiguous zone and then EEZ of 200 nautical miles. Now, we see that after 200 nautical mile below line, as you can see here, we have continental shelf. Now, this continental shelf you, you can see here is extended up to 350 nautical miles. Now, based on certain claims where states um, are having certain problems with respect to their base as far as their. So, as you can see here, you have 300 up to 350 nautical miles continental shelf can be extended. Now, friends, if you see continental shelf starts from this particular point and goes up to 350 nautical miles. Now, continental shelf is a traditional concept along with the concept of territorial sea, whereas the concept of EEZ is a newer one which came into being only after the discussions were happening for finalization of United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. Now, wherever on a certain calculation or based on certain calculation, wherever it is deemed necessary, the states may be given an additional right of 150 nautical mile, which goes beyond exclusive economic zone. Now, we will not delve into or dive into those technicalities, but we must understand that at the max, the continental shelf can be extended beyond 200 nautical miles and should not go beyond 350 nautical miles. Now, if you also see that if a ship is sailing from the water, which is situated here over the water column, if you see. Now, water column is the area where ships sail and you can see that there is complete freedom of navigation and overflight because there is no legislative jurisdiction that is applicable from the point where territorial sea ends that you can see at this particular red point. So, beyond this particular point, we can say that there is freedom of navigation or overflight. However, if you look at this particular area that comes 
within territorial sea, innocent passage has to be applied or rule pertaining to innocent passage would be applied. Now, what is innocent passage? We will see in the upcoming slides. Now, we must also discuss and talk about the point from where the measurement is to be taken. Is it the land mass from where or from where the uh, measurement has to be taken place? Well, friends, no. A particular point has to be identified and those particular points are then joined together. If you take again a horizontal line, then you will see that different points of the coastline are to be conjoined and a, and a line is to be drawn. If I take these lines, then in that particular scenario, let us say there is a coastal state and this is the horizontal line. There are districts situated on different at different points here. If we are to measure, then we are to not directly measure from the point where the sea waves start, but we are to identify a low tidal point of this particular line which is which would be parallel to this particular area. So, once low tidal points are identified, all these points which place or which are falling in the low tidal or which are falling at the low tidal points or low watermark points, then these low watermark points combine together create a single line and this single line is known as base line. And from this base line, you start measuring territorial waters, contiguous zone or exclusive economic zone. So, once you have a coastline, you will have your base line the, and this base line is created by joining these points. And how are these points identified? These points come into being largely by taking into account the low water mark. So, every coastal coastline will have a particular point where there is low tidal point where the high tide is no more into existence where there are low tides the water is permanently situated at all times it will not move from that particular point you will start measuring territorial water contiguous zone or your exclusive economic zone and then and this is how first you create a baseline so you will leave certain amount of water between baseline and the coastline and the water that you leave between the baseline or the coastline is known as internal waters. The legal effect of internal water is the same as that of the land territory. So, moving further, if you look at baseline, we have two methods of drawing baseline because you see friends that no coastline is simple, coastlines are not straight, coastlines can be zigzag, coastline can be curvy in nature, they can be of any nature, they are of geographical, uh, they, they completely depend on geographical circumstances. So, there are largely two methods through which we draw baseline. The first one is normal baseline and normal baseline is nothing but it goes along with your coastline. So, article 5 of United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea identifies what do we mean by normal baseline and it says the normal baseline for measuring the breadth of the territorial sea is the low water line along the coast as marked on large scale charts officially recognized by the coastal state. So, once your normal baseline is there which is normally the procedure for drawing the baseline unless and until there are exceptional circumstances or exceptional scenarios. What are those exceptional scenarios? Let us assume a coastline which is zigzag in nature. If the coastline is zigzag in nature, then certainly you will not be in a position to create one point here, then identify one point here or if you have rocky structures at this particular place where there are zigzag coastlines or you have, have a simple coastline but rocky structure is present, then in such situation also it becomes difficult to draw normal baseline and therefore, it is, it then becomes expedient to mark the outer points of the coastal state or the zigzag structure or the rocky structures and then join these outer structures to create a straight baseline. So, a straight baseline would certainly beneficial 
in giving more internal water to the coastal state. However, we also need to understand that it becomes very difficult for the coastal state uh, to draw a normal baseline where such special circumstances are in place. And the same was witnessed in Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case where if you look at Norwegian uh, coastline, it is not that simple. There are a lot of jords and other rocky structures which makes it difficult for the Norway to draw a straight, to draw a normal baseline and therefore it was justified in this case to draw a straight baseline as decided by International Court of Justice. Article 7 of the UNCLOS talks about a straight baseline and it says if there is a fringe of islands along the coast in its immediate vicinity, the method of a straight baselines joining appropriate points may be employed in drawing the baseline from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. The drawing of straight baselines must not depart to any appreciable extent from the general direction of the coast and the sea areas lying within the lines must be sufficiently closely linked to the land domain to be subject to the regime of internal waters. Where the method of straight baselines is applicable under paragraph 1, account may be taken in determining particular baselines of economic interest peculiar to the region concerned, the reality and the importance of which are clearly evidenced by long usage. The system of straight baselines may not be applied by a state in such a manner as to cut off the territorial sea of another state from the high seas or an exclusive economic zone. Now let us talk about the legal status of territorial sea. The legal status of the bed that is the land mass over which water column is situated is the seabed. The subsoil that is the area beneath that particular seabed and then suprajacent air space of the territorial sea. So, in territorial wherever there is territorial sea, the coastal state will have rights over the subsoil, seabed and suprajacent air space of the territorial sea. The breadth of the territorial sea as per article 3 of the Law of the Sea Convention will be 12 nautical miles, we have already discussed. The territorial sea entails the right of innocent passage. So, we need to understand that post or beyond 12 nautical mile, the ships or the vessels sailing are free to sail. They have freedom of navigation or under freedom of navigation or under the idea of mare liberum, there is complete liberty to sail from the areas beyond 12 nautical miles. But once they enter into the territorial sea of a particular coastal state, there are certain regulations that they have to take care of. Their sailing into the territorial waters or any vessel if sailing within the 12 nautical miles of a coastal state must pass innocently and this is known as that they have a right to innocent passage. Now, what do we mean by innocent passage? We will come to it. Article 18 of the Law of the Sea Convention says, passage includes not only actual passage through territorial sea, but also includes stopping and anchoring in so far as this is incidental to ordinary navigation or rendered necessary by force measure or distress. So, states can have certain regulations with respect to the 12 nautical miles. Because if you see that when vessels cross through any sea water, they might be forced to stop because of weather conditions, they might be in distress because of certain other technical reasons. So, when they anchor, when they stop, the states must ensure that help is provided to those vessels. So, it is not that the coastal state is only having a right over the territorial waters, but also having a duty towards these vessels. So, when right is entailed upon the coastal state, certain duties are also entailed upon the coastal states. So, the, it is the right of the coastal state to exercise legislative jurisdiction over any vessel crossing through territorial waters, but at the same time it is under a duty to provide a safe passage to the vessel that is passing through its coastal waters. In general, a passage must be continuous and expeditious. So, if we are to determine that whether a particular vessel is passing through the coastal waters of a particular state is innocent or not innocent. Generally, it will be deemed that it, if it is continuous and expeditious in nature, then we can say that it is innocent passage. Article 20 talks about 
Art article 20 says that if any submarine is to cross, submarines generally friends cross beneath the water or within the water column. They do not come above the surface, but when they cross territorial waters of a particular coastal state, they are under a duty to come above the surface and then sail through the water. They cannot hide themselves under the water and then sail, because it is the right of the coastal state to have security in place. That is why they have legislative jurisdiction. So, the aspect of jurisdiction is quite intense as far as territorial waters are concerned. Now, when we say the passage has to be innocent, what do we mean by it? The passage is innocent so long as it is not prejudicial to the peace, good order or security of the coastal state. Such passage shall take place in conformity with this convention and with other rules of international law. Passage of a foreign ship shall be considered to be prejudicial to the peace, good order or security of the coastal state if in the territorial sea it engages in any of the following activities, any threat or use of force against the sovereignty, territorial integrity or political independence of the coastal state or in any other manner in violation of the principles of international law embodied in the charter of the United Nations. Any exercise or practice with weapons of any kind, any act aimed at collecting information to the prejudice of the defense or security of the coastal state, any act of propaganda aimed at affecting the defense or security of the coastal state, the launching, landing or taking on board of any aircraft, the launching, landing or taking on board of any military device, the loading or unloading of any commodity, currency or person contrary to the customs, fiscal, immigration or sanitary laws and regulations of the coastal state, any act of willful and serious pollution contrary to this convention, any fishing activities, the carrying out of research or survey activities, any act aimed at interfering with any systems of communication or any other facilities or installations of the coastal state, any other activity not having a direct bearing on passage. So, these are the different types of acts if undertaken by any particular flag state through its vessel, then in such a scenario the passage of that particular vessel will not be deemed to be innocent. Otherwise, if there is continuous and expeditious passage through the coastal waters, then it will be deemed to be an innocent passage. Now, what are the rights of the coastal state in territorial waters? Because if you have jurisdiction over a particular uh, sea water that is 12 nautical mile attached to your coastline, then what are the rights which can be claimed, which can be exercised as far as that legislative jurisdiction is concerned. Article 21 says the coastal state, Article 21 of the United Nation Convention on Law of the Sea says the coastal state may adopt laws and regulations in conformity with the provisions of this convention and other rules of international law relating to innocent passage through the territorial sea in respect of all or any of the following. A. The safety of navigation and the regulation of maritime traffic. Now, since it is a right of the state, coastal state to maintain the decorum of the 12 nautical miles attached to the coastal state in the sea, it is also the duty of the coastal state to provide safety of navigation, to place lighthouses, to manage the traffic, to ensure that there is no collision, to ensure that there are proper traffic lanes within the sea to inform the concerned vessels if there are any weather uh, disturbing weather like conditions in place or any other problem if it is arising in that particular area attached to the coastal state. So, it has a right to maintain these navigational aspects within the 12 nautical mile. It also at the same time has a duty to maintain the safety in that particular region. It has also the duty to see to the fact that there are no pirates, there is no security threat to the vessels passing through the co to the uh, from the territorial waters of the coastal state. B. The protection of navigational aids and facilities and other facilities or installations. The protection of cables and pipelines. 
the conservation of the living resources of the sea, the prevention of infringement of the fisheries laws and regulations of the coastal state, the preservation of the environment of the coastal state and the prevention, reduction and control of pollution therefore. There. Now, if it is the right of the coastal state to protect and preserve marine life or any other living resource present in the territorial sea, it is then the duty of the vessels passing through the territorial waters of the coastal state to not to hamper all of these rights. G. Marine scientific research and hydrographic surveys are again the rights of the coastal state in territorial sea. The prevention of infringement of the customs, fiscal, immigration or sanitary laws and regulations of the coastal state. Well, friends, G and H also fall within the domain of contiguous zone as well as exclusive economic zone. It is also the right of the coastal state to see to the fact that there is no environmental pollution, there is no sanitary effects caused by any particular vessel belonging to another flag state adversely affecting the coastal state. Article 25 says rights of protection of the coastal state. The coastal state may take the necessary steps in its territorial sea to prevent passage which is not innocent. So, as we know what passage is not innocent or what passage cannot be considered to be innocent, accordingly the coastal state can take appropriate measures. In the case of ships proceeding to internal waters or a call at a port facility outside internal waters, the coastal state also has the right to take the necessary steps to prevent any breach of the conditions to which admission of those ships to internal waters or such a call is subject. The coastal state may without discrimination in form or in fact among foreign ships suspend temporarily in specified areas of its territorial sea the innocent passage of foreign ships if such suspension is essential for the protection of its security including weapons exercises. Now, apart from the rights of the coastal state, the coastal states also have certain duties to be undertaken as I have already told you. Article 24 talks about the duties of the coastal state in territorial waters. The coastal state shall not hamper the innocent passage of foreign ships, since innocent passage is one of the fundamental rights of the vessels passing through the, passing through the territorial waters of any coastal state. Now, as I told you, innocent passage is a right which is a compromise which came out due to the fact that freedom of navigation is an essential fundamental right of the vessels and it has been recognized since years, since decades or you can say since centuries. Mare liberum is the basic concept which, which underlines the basic idea of freedom of navigation and freedom of navigation collides with the idea that coastal state can have jurisdiction over the sea water. So, as a compromise at the conferences which led to conclusion of United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, we see a middle way harmonization being reached that innocent passage would be allowed, that ships are free to pass, but then they must not be prejudicial to the peace and order and security of the coastal state. And therefore, the coastal state shall not hamper the innocent passage of foreign ships through the territorial sea except in accordance with this convention, which means that only if the passage is not innocent, only then the coastal state can take any type of action against that particular vessel. In particular, in the application of this convention or of any laws or regulations adopted in conformity with this convention, the coastal state shall not impose requirements on foreign ships which have the practical effect of denying or impairing the right of innocent passage or discriminate in form or in fact against the ships of any state or against ships carrying cargoes to, from or on behalf of any state. So, it is incumbent upon the coastal state to not to differentiate or classify different types of ships below based on their flag state. That is, if a Chinese ship is passing through Indian waters or an Italian ship is passing through internal waters or sorry your, your territorial waters, then it must not differentiate between an Italian ship or a Chinese ship. It must treat them equally. The coastal state shall give appropriate publicity to any danger to navigation of which it has knowledge within its territorial 
sea. So, again a very pertinent duty upon the coastal state that if any danger is present in the territorial waters of the coastal state and the coastal state is aware of it, it must inform. Now, what happens if the coastal state is not aware? Then if any issue comes into being between the two states, that is the coastal state and the flag state, it will be divide, it will be decided as per the adjudicating body depending on the circumstances. One example of the same can be taken by looking at a case called Corfu Channel case which was decided in 1949. Here the matter was referred to the International Court of Justice by UK and Albania. The fact of the case are that UK ships were crossing through Corfu Channel situated near Albanian jurisdiction or which comes within the Albanian jurisdiction. Now, as the ships were crossing through Corfu Channel, they faced a damage to ship as mines were placed in the Corfu Channel. UK claimed against Albania that it was the duty of the Albania to remove those mines placed at, an, at certain earlier instances. Since Albania did not remove those mines and those mines as they blasted affected UK ships and life at the vessel of UK. Now, here Albania claimed that it was not aware of the mines being placed in the Corfu channel. It, it laid down its argument on the basis of being unaware about the mines being placed and therefore it was not at fault. Now, whether Albania was negligent in its act by not being aware of the mines being placed in the Corfu channel. Court decided in favor of UK and said that it is the duty of the coastal state to be aware of any danger that is being present in its waters. And therefore, in today's time also, after unclause also, we can say that it is the duty of the coastal state to be aware of any significant danger that is present in its territorial waters and be informing it to the vessels belonging to other flag state that how this danger can be avoided or to save them from such danger. So, it is the duty of the coastal state under article 24 that states are to protect the flag states or the ships bearing flags of another state crossing through the territorial waters of the coastal states. Now, as far as contiguous zone is concerned, the jurisdiction of the coastal state diminishes to a significant aspect. Now, no legislative jurisdiction is applicable, rather extraterritorial jurisdiction or you can say enforcement jurisdiction gets applicable as far as contiguous zone is concerned. In a zone contiguous to its territorial sea, described as the contiguous zone, the coastal state may exercise the control necessary to prevent infringement of its customs, fiscal, immigration or sanitary laws and regulations within its territory or territorial sea. B. Punish infringement of the above laws and regulations committed within its territory or territorial sea. As far as exclusive economic zone is concerned, as we know that it extends 200 nautical miles from the baseline, the jurisdictional aspect of the coastal state in exclusive economic zone again diminishes as it goes beyond contiguous zone. That is after the 24 nautical miles. In EZ, the jurisdiction of the coastal state is limited to extraction of minerals and other kind of resources. It can prohibit other states to undertake any economic activity a up to 200 nautical miles and that is why the states have been given exclusivity as far as economic aspects are concerned in favor of the coastal state. Now, why 200 specifically? There are reasons and what are the reasons? Reasons primarily are political and historical. The basic reason being the difference of claim over the continental shelf by different states. Developed states especially had already claims over the continental shelf. Now, continental shelf since is traditional or conventional in nature 
we see that many of the decolonized states never had a continental shelf or any sort of historical claim as far as continental shelf is concerned. And therefore, in order to come up with an equal share of resources, the idea of exclusive economic zone comes into being. That is a fixed portion for everyone, so that sea can be divided equally amongst the states. The coastal states then will have fixed measurement that is 200 nautical mile and not beyond that. Well, yes, we have continental shelf still in existence because then the developed states or the states who already had their claims over continental shelf will not be ready to accept exclusive economic zone. So, on certain calculation, continental shelf claims are also recognized under United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea. Well, we will not go deep into those calculations and reasons, but yes, to understand this particular aspect, we must understand for the time being that continental shelf is also recognized. At the same time, the newness in the continental shelf is also introduced and this newness is in the form of exclusive economic zone. Other reasons were that no biological, geographical or e ecological significance was there and we also see that islands or decolonized states were devoid of any type of continental shelf. Now, 200 nautical mile has been given to archipelagos, to individual island states also at the same time. The states are not devoid of claim over sea water just because of their size or structure. They will have their 200 nautical mile provided they are coastal states. Article 56 talks about rights, jurisdiction and duties of coastal state in EEZ. In the EEZ, the coastal state has sovereign rights for the purpose of exploring and exploiting, conserving and managing the natural resources, whether living or non-living, of the water supra-adjacent to the seabed and of the seabed and its subsoil and with regard to other activities for the economic exploitation and exploration of the zone, such as the production of energy from the water, currents and winds. Jurisdiction as provided for in the relevant provisions of this convention with regard to the establishment and use of artificial islands, installations and structures. Marine scientific research, the protection and preservation of the marine environment, other rights and duties provided for in this convention. In exercising its rights and performing its duties under this convention in the EEZ, the coastal state shall have due regard to the rights and duties of other states and shall act in a manner compatible with the provisions of this convention. Article 58 provides for rights and duties of other states in the EEZ. So, as I have already explained this particular aspect that they have right of navigation, overflight and laying of submarines and pipelines. So, in navigation, they can create sea, sea lanes, pollution control and then under overflight, you have innocent flying governed by International Civil Aviation Organization. Now, friends, as I told you that the idea of continental shelf has also not been given away. The idea of continental shelf is still is in existence and problem comes into being where the states are adjacent to each other or opposite to each other. Now, let us assume a situation that there are two states opposite to each other, state A and then you have a state B. The law says that you can have 200 nautical miles water in front of you, but let us say the distance between A and B is, is 200 nautical mile. Then how do you divide the water area between A and B? Do you divide it equally that is 100? and 100 or you not divide it equally, but you divide it on some other grounds. Now friends, let me take you to 1958 convention which was Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf. Under article 6 of the Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf, it provided for a solution and the solution was equidistance principle or rule of equidistance that is you divide it equally. But after UNCLOS came into being, UNCLOS diluted this particular compulsion. So, whosoever was party to the Geneva Convention 1958 was supposed to divide the water equally, but 
whosoever is now party to United Nations Convention on Law of the, Th Law of the Sea 1982 is not bound to divide it equally because in between these two conventions there were certain cases that had happened with respect to delimitation of continental shelf because the states were not happy with the rule of equidistance principle being applicable due to the obvious factors of differing geographical conditions. All states do not possess or have the simple scenario of a straight line being created. The states can have different coastlines as I told you that Norway in Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case was having a zigzag line or you can say it as having jords and uh, rocky structures attached to its coastline. So, in such scenarios a state can have a concave shaped or a co convex shaped uh, coastline or a concave shaped coastline. In such scenarios if you tend to divide the continental shelf by applying equidistance a certain state would be a disadvantageous position. How this can happen we will discuss and understand by North Sea continental shelf cases. So, let us look at North Sea continental shelf case which identifies a practical problem with the application of equidistance principle. The case concern obviously delimitation of continental shelf as we can see. Now, as you can see in the picture itself you have Netherlands here the coastline of Netherlands is concave in nature. You can see Denmark here the coastline of Denmark is also concave in nature, but you can also see Germany here the coastline of Germany is concave in nature. We will discuss and understand this particular aspect of delimitation of continental shelf through North Sea continental shelf cases. And as you can see Netherlands here which is having a convex shape of its coastline at the same time Denmark having convex shape of its coastline and if you look at Germany we have a concave shaped coastline and when you draw straight lines from the point where Netherland ends and from the point where Denmark's boundary ends you will end up drawing a triangle here a type of tangent is then drawn wherein the share of Germany gets reduced because again because again you are applying equidistance principle and leaving a small portion of share for Germany. So, if you look at this particular case and if you look at the historical background of these states we will see that Netherlands and Denmark were party to the Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf 1958. So, they were bound by article 6 that is they had to apply equidistance principle. Well friends they were not hesitant in applying this particular principle because they were getting a larger chunk of share as far as equidistance principles application is concerned. But you will see that Germany was at a disadvantageous position. And also we must note that Germany was not party to the Geneva Convention on Continental Shelf Cases 1958. So, here whether Germany was bound to apply equidistance principle the court decided in favor of Germany. It said that Germany is not bound to apply equidistance principle because it is not party to the convention firstly, secondly equidistance principle also is not a customary rule of international law. Now, if you see that continental shelf is getting divided by, applica by application of equidistance rule then a number of other states would also be in a disadvantageous position. So, in order to avoid any disadvantage to the states which are having a disadvantageous coastline, then we must have certain amount of flexibility as far as application of the rule of delimitation of continental shelf is concerned. This case helps 
in the construction of rule pertaining to delimitation of continental shelf in United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea is also concerned. It does not make it mandatory for the states to divide it equally. If the states are situated opposite to each other, then there is no problem for state A and for state B to divide it equally. But then if the states are adjacent to each other or if the states are opposite to each other, but then a particular state, but then a particular state is having a distorted geographical condition, a distorted boundary line or coastline, it is having rocky structures, it is having jugards, it, ha it is having jords. In such situations, what do we do? Then in such situations, we see that United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea gives an option for application of equidistance principle, but then states can also on their own negotiate and go for proportional distribution of the continental shelf. As we see here in the North Sea continental shelf cases that a, as the court denied the application of equidistance principle in the case where Netherlands and Denmark are arguing for equidistance principle and Germany is asking for its proportionate share and ask these three states to negotiate and sign an agreement as far as distribution of the continental shelf is concerned. And as you can see here, the smaller portion that Germany was initially ge getting was enlarged to these areas as well. So, after negotiation we see a certain extended portion was also brought into the pocket of Germany. What should be the basis of doing so? So, court went on to help the states to identify the basis of division of continental shelf on the basis of proportionality wherever such complex situations come into being. And it said that wherever there are differing geographical, geomorphological circumstances that is the, that is the relevant circumstances available, the states should not divide it equally but must go for just and equitable sharing. And as you can see, the principle of equidistance is meant to be customary international law was claimed by Netherlands and Denmark but refused by the court wherein the Federal Republic of Germany contended that the correct rule was one according to which each of the states concerned should have a just and equitable share of the available continental shelf in proportion to the length of its sea frontage. So while denying the application of article 6 on Germany, it concluded and said that equitable principle can be applicable as far as such a situation is concerned. So, delimitation of continental shelf can be seen by applying two rules. One is equidistance, the other one being the equitable principle that is proportional division by the states concerned. So, with this I will uh, stop and conclude my class of law of the sea. I thank you for your patient listening. Namaskar.